Hello, everyone. Oh. Good evening. I would like to call to order the Cumberland School Department School Committee meeting today, Thursday, September 13th, 2018 at 7.38, and ask that you please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Welcome again. Next item on the agenda, approval of the agenda. Pleasure of the committee. Mr. Hess makes a motion to approve the agenda. Do I have a second? Second by Mr. Denon. All in favor? Aye. Against? Ayes have it. 7-0. Thank you. Next item on the agenda is the consent agenda, which contains the approval of the minutes for the regular meeting, 8-23-2018, special meeting, 9-5-2018, Approval of a minute of minutes, executive session 823 2018, executive session 95 2018, the enrollment report of 91 2018, the school police report of 81 2018, the residency truancy report of 91 2018, and the student handbooks all schools. Pleasure of the committee. Mr. DeMonica makes a motion to approve the consent agenda. Do I have a second? Second by Mrs. Friedman. All in favor? Aye. Against? The ayes have it. 7-0. Thank you. Next item on the agenda is the report out of executive session meeting. There was a meeting tonight, 9-13-2018, upstairs. There were no votes taken. I'm looking for a vote to seal the minutes of the executive session meeting. Pleasure of the committee. Mr. Denon makes a motion to seal the minutes of the executive session. Do I have a second? Second by Mrs. Friedman. All in favor? Aye. Against? Ayes have it. 7-0. Thank you. Something's looking different to me in the windows. I can't. Okay, the tints, that, that's what it is. Yes, okay. That's it, in the shades. Okay, all right, good. Excellent. Next item, sorry about that. Next item on the agenda is the, <laughs> I see the reflection off my forehead. <laughs> Superintendent report. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Dennis. I am. Oh, okay. Next item on the agenda, superintendent's report. Mr. Mitchell. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Good evening, everyone. Uh, as you can see, item one, uh, Susan Kelly, uh, who is a member of the Cumberland Lincoln Rotary Club uh, was supposed to be here this evening to give you all an update uh, on the Interact Club, which is the um, high school uh, club that is associated with Rotary. And Susan Kelly has done a great job of mobilizing students uh, in the high school. And there's a pretty uh, active group of students doing some wonderful things in the community. Remember, the Rotary Club's motto is service above self and uh, she really has done a nice job of working with our students she had hoped to be here this evening to uh, let you know what their plans uh, are for the 1819 uh, school year but unfortunately apparently she's um, uh, has some sort of transportation issue I think that she might be having difficulty on a flight and could not be here so we'll make sure that she uh, is here uh, perhaps at the next meeting to report out on the good work that she is a leading in the high school with our students. The next thing that I wanted to talk to you about is a transportation. I know that members of the committee wanted uh, to um, hear uh, uh, of any issues uh, associated with uh, Durham and the bus transportation. So I did get some information from Durham, but I also asked each of the principals to provide me with some information about buses that may be uh, consistently late picking students up uh, in the morning and bringing them to school on time. And the same is true for the afternoon. So I have a little bit of information to share with you. The, the most of the concern that I have been receiving, and I, and I know that uh, some members of the school committee have been hearing as well, 
I know that plus 19, which um, uh, to the Ashton School has, has been an issue. There were, were a couple of complaints about that particular bus. And um, I think the single biggest concern is it hasn't, well, there were a couple of concerns. But the single biggest concern is that students are not being brought to school on time. So uh, I have had conversations with uh, Durham, specifically Paul Neves, and he assures me that on that the problem will be resolved on Monday. I have uh, contacted some parents who expressed concern to let them know that the expectation is that students will be picked up at their bus stop on time and that they will be delivered to school in the morning before the school day starts. So uh, hopefully bus 19 will be resolved on Monday and those few parents that I have communicated with, I've asked them to let me know if um, that timeline is not being met. Uh, BF Norton uh, has an issue with uh, bus 42 in the afternoon. Uh, students are not being picked up uh, in some cases up to a half an hour after the close of the school day. So uh, I, I will be having a conversation. I got that information today from the BF Norton principal. I will be having a conversation uh, with Mr. Neves about that tomorrow. Community seems to be having an issue. I know that some of you have heard about bus 34. The single, well, there are a couple issues with bus 34 consistently getting to school on time appears to be one of the issues. The other issue is that bus is full. And capacity is 70 students, and it's my understanding that there are 68 students on that bus right now, uh, which you know makes it uncomfortable. So uh, the, the bus company is working to alleviate uh, that overcrowding issue. It appears also that there are some is other issues at community, especially in the morning, um, with the bus company consistently uh, getting uh, students to school on time. I know that bus 34 has been an issue in the morning as well, but uh, there were some other buses that seem to be having an issue with consistency. Now, I don't know if it has anything to do with the construction, but regardless of that, uh, as I stated earlier, uh, the bus company has a responsibility to pick students up at their bus stop on time and get them to school before the school day starts. And you can you know, ask me any questions after I run through the list here. Cumberland Hill, um, there is a mini bus that is uh, consistently late. Many buses generally carry um, students with special needs. So bus 41 um, in the morning at Cumberland Hill has been consistently late. Something has to be done to resolve that bus. And in the afternoon, uh, the, there is a, a bus that goes to the YMCA, bus 7, and also bus 41 are consistently late in picking up students, so something has to be done about that. The principal of Garvin School reports that there are no major issues. There are no major issues at McCourt. Not exactly sure about North Cumberland Middle School. Um, I um, have not heard uh, anything specifically about that. The bus company did not report anything, but I, I uh, will be speaking to the principal tomorrow to um, ask if, if, if there are any concerns with the buses at North Cumberland Middle School. And the, the only issue at the high school is apparently buses 31 and 33. There may be an issue with them, uh, with that bus consistently getting to school on time for the start of the school day. And the bus company reports that that issue will be resolved uh, at the beginning of next week. So, you know, that is, um, you know, a, a summary of the issues that have been reported to me. And I can tell you that the, I have received most of the concerns that I have received uh, via email 
um, is the issue with bus 19 um, that goes to, to Ashton because it is consistently late. In fact, I think it's getting there after the start of the school day, which is um, you know, unacceptable. So hopefully, uh, as I said, that issue will be resolved on Monday. Mitchell, thank, thank you for the update. Uh, I do have a couple of questions. It, it does seem like <clears throat> we're in worse shape than we started the school year last year with the busing, or is it, are we about the same? We can't. You know, um, I, I mean, I, I think, I mean, I, I think that's a fair question. I, you know, uh, Cindy Shabbat and I, you know, generally get uh, calls about or emails about transportation, and I think if you were to ask Mrs. Shabbat, I, I believe that there have been fewer concerns this year, but you know we're talking about transporting children, so and getting them to school on time and picking them up at the bus stop on time. That's an issue. So uh, I don't, I don't know that there are more uh, issues this year as compared to last, but um, certainly there are issues that have to be addressed. My concern with the special needs bus at JJM. They're coming from across town. Even if they leave early enough, it's, I don't know what they're doing for mileage, but maybe it's not, it seems like it's not possible that they can even make that commute in that amount of time. Is that, yeah, okay. Yeah, I, yeah, I don't, I mean, I think the way up, you know, I, I think, I don't want to be disrespectful here, but that's what they do. And okay. So they think that's the, yeah, seems I gotcha. Me, seems to me that they need to get this resolved, right? I mean, I, and, and again, I, I'm not trying to be disrespectful, and I will say yeah. that whenever I, I talk to Mr. Lynch, he's, he's very respectful and responsive to me, um, and all I can tell you is that we're going to continue to keep working on these issues, and, and I know that some school committee members provide some very specific um, information that is helpful, so I can say, you know, this is what I'm hearing, um, you know, we need to get it resolved. So, I, I mean, I, I can say that Mr. Neves has told me that they're looking to, and I don't want to be inaccurate here, but, but I'm, I'm pretty sure he said that they're looking to add a, a bus that may help to uh, resolve some of this, uh, some of these issues. Excellent. Mr. Fiorelli? I just want to say that bus 19 last year uh, getting to Ashton was a challenge for Durham the entire school year. So I'm hoping that they can actually solve the problem this year in a timely fashion. I, I will stress that uh, when I speak to the bus company as well. Anyone else? Mm -hmm. I, I think it's highly time to start looking at a busing contract and uh, decide whether Durham is the vendor that we want to keep here because year in, year in, year out, you know, Paul Neves is a nice guy, Ian's a nice woman down here, but we still have the same issues. And if we're putting 68 children on a school bus, it's going to arrive late. Otherwise, the kids are going to get on that bus at 6 a.m. to get there on time with so many stops. And they should have known better already if they got 68 children on a bus to get there on time. And it's time to start looking at at a, in a different way, instead of financial, we look at what the children are losing in educational time in front of a teacher because that amounts to money as well. And time to move on, I think. It, it is a concern, Mr. DeMonica, especially when the kids haven't even been wearing winter jackets and um, um, construction, and you know, it's tight on the bus. But anyone else? Mr. Denon? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I know, so it was our last meeting where we talked about this, and, and uh, we I asked for a report on when the buses were getting to school in the morning. And my understanding from Mr. Neves through an email is that we'll, we'll have that at the next meeting. We, we're likely to have it the next meeting. I, I think I think it's easy for them to produce that. I think we've seen that in the past. It was just a report that they could print out that had the, the times uh, using their GPS technology. Um, so I, I, you know, I sort of reiterate that. Uh, because I, 
we're hearing from parents that, that kids are getting to school late. It sounds like you've talked to principals that are getting to school late. I just want to make sure we all understand the, the scope of the problem. Um, the other thing I'd like to know is sort of how many kids are expected on each bus. So, you know, they should be able to, to have a, uh, an idea. And I, I think we've seen this in the past where you can look at a single route and you can say it's going to pick up five at this stop, ten at this stop, whatever. Um, I think that would be helpful to have as well. So we could compare the number who are supposed to be on the bus versus the number who are actually on the bus. Again, they did that for us in the past. Uh, hopefully they can do that for us too. Um, you know, we, I got an email from a parent, I think a bunch of us did, where her daughter's on the bus for 50 minutes going to school, um, and they live a little over a mile away, I think she said, 1.2 miles. Um, and I know where, the, where they live, and it, it's pretty close to community school. Um, I think we, we owe it to, to families like that to figure out what's going on. What's, why is it taking so long? So um, that just seems excessive to me. Uh, so thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Mr. Mitchell, anything else to add? Or okay. No, that's all I have, Mr. Chen. Thank you. Next item on the agenda, chairperson's report, school start update. Um, I'm not going to give a, f a whole report on the on the school start, um, but Mr. Mitchell, I believe it was uh, everything ran smooth. I know you and Tony, Assistant Superintendent Mr. Bonanno, made the rounds. As I uh, as I have said many times, uh, it really is impressive to see um, how, you know, it's it's like there was no summer vacation. It's like, you know, the 20th of June, uh, the day after the 20th of June when, when everyone, um, when the school year ended, um, you know, everyone's back in their routines. Everything uh, went very smoothly. As you all know, the biggest issue was the extremely um, high temperatures and that's the thing that we um, were struggling with. But um, beyond that, um, you know, the coordination that takes place uh, at all of our schools in the morning and at the end of the school day, um, it's, it's, they didn't miss a beat. It really is an impressive thing to see. So kudos to um, the students and staff at all of our schools for making it a, a real smooth transition to the start of the 18-19 school year. Oh, oh. Committee, uh, Mr. Mitchell, and everyone. What gathered my uh, piqued my interest was I got to visit McCourt Middle School. I wanted to see the new admin layout. Um, it's excellent. I get to spend some time with Dr. Susan Cody, the Assistant Principal of Teaching and Learning, uh, Mrs. Erin Oliver, the Assistant Principal of School Culture, and Mrs. Uh, Tanya Rayo, Academic Coach, working under Dr. Cody. This the dynamic that they've put in there. Tony, I can see you shaking your head as well. It's excellent. They relocated their offices, um, offices they're uh, interacting with students. I get to meet a student that just transferred from North Smithfield. Uh, they're making it uh, very approachable for the student to get acclimated with teaching and, you know, and, and learning and also with other students as well. I get to meet the uh, new police, middle school police officer assigned to both middle schools. Get to chat with him and walk around in his routine. I was very impressed on the layout of that school. And I'm, I can see, you know, I, I saw good things happening and I see even better things going forward uh, with that one school that I got to visit. So I was very impressed with the dynamic going on over there. And also I know uh, our student resource officer here at the high school, uh, Officer Kevin Kolick, retired so we wish I wish him the best of uh, luck going forward and I know we do have a new officer assigned Mr. Mitchell but has not started yet and we have fill-ins could you talk a little bit on yeah that? yes uh, yeah thank you for for bringing that up Mr. Chairman we um, the uh, officer Saltzman is the officer who will be taking over for uh, Kevin Kolick and we're, we're going to invite Kevin in so that you all can, um, you know, let him know how much you appreciated his service over the years. Um, but um, Officer Saltzman um, has a, you know, has a, is out on a medical and is, in fact, he may even be back uh, tomorrow. But um, the chief has <laughs> been acting as our SRO this week. So he Excellent. Has, He's been very visible. In fact, I, I've spent a lot of time in the high school, and and uh, to see the chief 
hanging out with the students and he's been in uh, the uh, cafeteria, highly visible. I think it's a good thing. And, and I really appreciate the fact that the chief has um, stepped up and volunteered to be present uh, in the absence of the resource officer. And, you know, we have a good relationship. And, and you know, uh, I think one of the things that um, is, you know, fairly easy to understand is all its construction that's happening in the town requires details. So there it requires officers to be there to direct traffic and, and what have you. Um, so, you know, they're scrambling to make sure that uh, the community is safe and to meet all of their obligations. So I do appreciate the chief stepping up to help us. I also saw Captain Faye directing traffic and uh, pulling people over, I think, or what was going on over there. But. All right, excellent. Anyone else would like to add anything? Any personal experience in school start update? Anything? Okay. Next item on the agenda. Thank you, Mr. Mitchell. Next item on the agenda, reports of standing committees. Payment of bills. Mr. DeMonica. Payment of bills. Uh, Mr. Chairman, we had uh, two sets of vouchers tonight that we went through. First is the 17-18 uh, school year. The uh, amount is $341,412.63. It passed upstairs in a 3 to 0 vote, and I move passage of that set of vouchers. Thank you, Mr. DeMonica. Mr. DeMonica makes a motion for the payment of bills. Do I have a second? Second. Second by Mr. Fiorillo. All in favor? Aye. Against? Ayes have it, 7-0. Next is 2018-2019 uh, school year. The vouchers are $1,193,652.86. It passed upstairs in a 3-0 vote, and I would move passage of uh, that voucher as well. Mr. DeMonica makes a motion for the passage of the vouchers. Do I have a second? Second by Mr. Hess. Mr. Denon, all in favor? Oh, do I have a motion? A second, all in favor? The ayes have it, 7-0. Sorry about that. Next item on the agenda, Mr. DeMonica, anything Mr. else? Chair, we did have a meeting upstairs tonight. Uh, we got an update from the building manager in regards to the uh, 2018 uh, Budget amounts. We uh, also talked about approving a HR consultant extension contract, communication communication service contract. Um, we did approve the new company coming in for the student yearbooks. We amended the 2019 year school budget so that it aligns with what the town has appropriated for this year. Uh, we approved a fiscal note for the teachers association contract and some additional moving supplies that we had to purchase for the summer so the work could be completed. Also, uh, we talked about the pool and additional options in regards to that and uh, having a company come out to service our AEDs uh, throughout the district. That was it, thank you. Thank you, Mr. DeMonica. Next item on the agenda, policy and procedures subcommittee update. Mr. Fiorello. Yes, policy did meet uh, the other night. We had a full agenda. We discussed our early entry to kindergarten and first grade policy, which we've made some changes to, to bring it uh, in line with state law. We also have updated the high school proficiency grading um, policy, which we'll discuss later on in the agenda. And also we have, uh, we discussed further and voted on the um, graduation requirements. If you remember the last time we discussed uh, instituting a waiver for certain students on the foreign language requirement. Students that have proven that they have done their work but have not been able to achieve success uh, with two years of a language. So we'll be uh, voting on that also. And we also did a, a short discussion on the FERPA policy, which is the free education uh, rights that all students have um, as it relates to students who reach the age of majority. Uh, we took no action on that and we'll discuss that probably a little further. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Fiorello. Next item on the agenda, Achievement and Communication Subcommittee update. Mr. Denon. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Achievement and Communication Subcommittee did not meet this week um, mm -hmm. to make room for the supersized policy meeting that we had on Tuesday night. Um, we are planning the next few meetings for Achievement uh, before November. And uh, if you have any feedback on what you'd like us to tackle in the next two months, uh, please send it to me. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Denon. 
Next item on the agenda, comments from the public. If you would like to make a comment to the school committee, please step up to the podium, state your name. Hearing none. Thank you. Next item on the agenda, public hearing. Reading of amended policies. Mr. Fiorello. Yes. No problem. That's okay. We, um, I would ask, let me just sneak on yours. I would ask that the J1 early entry to kindergarten and first grade be read into the uh, record, as well as I-13, the high school. I'm sorry, I'm going to hold off on the high school proficiency grading at this time. I will ask that I-14, the high school proficiency graduation policy, be read um, into the record. So just to be clear, it's just going to be J1 and I-14. And I I-13 will be tabled, correct? Uh, and not read into the... Right. Okay. All right. At this time, I'd like to welcome public comment as related to J1 and I-14. Please step up to the podium. Pleasure of the committee. Anyone? Okay. Moving on. Next item on the agenda is old business, discussion and a vote to approve amended policy. J1. Mr. Fiorello? Yes, we, uh, as we discussed, we have been discussing this policy over the last couple of months. Um, the first thing that we need to mention is that we have actually tweaked the title of the policy. It is now the admission to kindergarten and first grade. So if it passes tonight, that'll be the new title of the policy. It'll remain as J1. Um, we have also, um, what we have done is we're going to stick with our September 1st deadline for students to reach that age um, in order to be able to enroll in kindergarten and first grade. But also, we're going to allow a student who has pr proven proficiency in an accredited or state-run or state-approved program um, outside of the district to enter first grade after a review of the superintendent's office uh, to ensure that they actually have the proficiency and they're capable of doing that work and that will really just uh, rest on the sole discretion of the superintendent and his team. Um, we also had a change, we have to make a small amendment. I'm sorry, I just need to get to the right place here. We had to add one quick line. Did we change that one? Mr. So you're really looking to make an amendment now to add a line, or yes. was that already? It, w it was, we realized that there was a slight problem. Uh, we added some language just to clarify that students that have, that have achieved the uh, proficiency in the kindergarten program outside of the district can actually uh, move into it. What we had was we had a line that said the September 1st requirement shall not be waived. Uh, and then right below that, we actually are waiving it. Yeah, so we just had to tweak the language slightly. Uh, it's all on the drive, though, uh, and it's on uh, the website, I believe. Mr. Mr. Adams, so we make an amendment right now? So I will move to amend. So Mr. Fiorillo makes a motion to amend J1, early entry to kindergarten, first grade, as read is read into the record and also it's in our drives. drives. Do I have a second? Second, second by Mr. DeMonica. When I looked at it earlier today, I thought we had changed it. We did not. That's okay. We're making the change now. Yeah. Um, Mr. Mitchell, did you have a recommendation? I know we had talked about it earlier today on the final language. Given the fact that I was in the visioning session all day okay. today, I did not have a chance. All right. You know what, then? We're going to have to table it. Yep. I'll make a motion to table until our next meeting, and we'll just clean it up and bring it back. So, Mr. Adams, we we send, or we just put it through as a recommendation of a no and then table? Mr. Adams. Uh, 
So we have a okay. So we have a motion. We have a second. All in favor? Nay. nay. Against? Nay. Yes. Thank you. So it fails. It fails. Five to two. <laughs> Mr. Dennett. I, I just want to point out that the, the the amendment that we're talking about, that we will talk about next time, does not substantially change the policy at all. It it clarifies. It it kind of makes sense between two sections and. Um, basically, we're, I don't have it in front of me, but what we're saying is we're not going to waive the September 1st deadline, and I'm paraphrasing, um, for kindergarten, but we will for first grade, given what we're about to say in the next paragraph. That's really all it is. So there's nothing substantial about it, but we'll take care of it next time. No, and what the what the, this policy is actually going to keep is the reason that we actually instituted this policy a few years ago, which was to allow for students that were coming into the district having already... Um, achieve success in a kindergarten program to then come in and start first grade without having to repeat. So the uh, the original intent of this policy actually is remaining. And as Mr. Denon said, it's literally like six words. So I'm looking for a motion to table J1. Mr. Denon makes a motion to table. Do I have a second? Second by Mr. Hess. All in favor? Aye. Against? Ayes have it. 7-0. Thank you. We'll get that back on the agenda with the amended yeah. uh, content on the drives. Next item on the agenda, new business. Visiting sessions for school bond referendum presentation. Mr. Mitchell. Excuse me. Okay, we have uh, with us this evening Dr. Frank Walker. He led the uh, first of a two-day session, visioning session today. It was um, just based on my observation and personal involvement. It was an exciting day. And I think the reason that it was so exciting is because we had uh, representation of all of our constituents. There were uh, parents, educators. Um, there were represent representatives uh, from um, the town, and we had approximately 10 students involved in the process, both middle and high school students, and they were, everyone was actively uh, involved. So it really was uh, an interesting day and we got a lot uh, accomplished and I know that Frank is going to give us a, just a, a, a snippet of, of what was uh, covered today. Um, Heather, who's in the audience, um, was a participant Mike was a participant, Tony, Alex, and Jen um, were also participants. So I, I, I think I um, am speaking for everyone when I say that it was a, a really full and um, definitely a collaborative day. So with that, um, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Locker. Welcome, Dr. Locker. Good evening. Good to be back with you. Uh, I, I presented before you, I think it was about two months ago, uh, describing the, the concept of visioning in general. And we today are right in the middle of it. We're going to do another full day tomorrow. I have uh, agendas for the two days. That if I could just... Um, Please, yes. It's just to give you a flavor. Um, as I had said when I met with you before, the, the concept of visioning is to do some deep thinking with a, a mixed group of stakeholders to establish concepts of future teaching and learning that 
in this case are a prelude to doing the master plan. So we, we, we are ultimately uh, going to end up with a set of concepts that our architect is going to be working with uh, that look at different ways to make appropriate modifications to your existing buildings. Um, but the visioning uh, does end up with concepts related to those. Um, but in order to get to those facilities concept, we need to work through education. And so uh, the two days of work is probably about 60 to 70% focusing on education, and then 30 to 40 uh, focusing on facilities. And we do that after we work through education. So today, I just want to present a, a, a couple of quick understandings of what we did today uh, and the trajectory of where we're going. I, I will clarify that our work does not cast in stone uh, you know, new ways of doing things, but it does set um, a start for looking at uh, either confirming what we're doing now or uh, making changes. And, and it's not curricular changes so much as it is delivery methods, how we deliver education. As the superintendent mentioned, we had a diverse group of stakeholders uh, I think it was about 40, 45 people, something like that. Um, enough for us to have seven or eight table teams uh, of six people a piece. The dynamics of six people working together is fantastic uh, because it um, allows people to have a deep enough think tank to work with their with their community members and, and fellow educators, um, but it also doesn't squash out the introverts. It gives people a voice. And the other wonderful thing about uh, multiple table teams is I can ask the same question to all of them and w it's easy then to see the answers and, and if they consistently are answering a question they, they might be right uh, but if they're all across the board in, in responding to a question that means we have more work to do because there's no community consensus about things so uh, that table team concept is very effective in both moving the issue along but also measuring um, the, the nature of the response. Um, I'm not going to labor over the agendas, but um, I'll just say that the days are organized as a series of challenges ranging from a half hour long to a couple of hours long. Um, they start with education questions and with, with some small bits of facilities. And then but once we get into the beginning of the second day, we clearly are applying our discussion about the future of education here directly to facilities. And we will walk out of the day tomorrow with some very specific concepts that we'll have our architect looking at as part of master planning. And, and, and he, of course, will bring a whole host of other issues that are appropriate for, for, for managing um, school buildings. So um, I do want to reinforce that both days are underscored by the concept of 21st century learning. And in fact, as you kicked off the meeting this morning um, and, and read a letter from the state, uh, they are looking for concepts of 21st century learning. Um, and many of those concepts directly challenge all of our traditions. So this is deep work. This is hard work. Um, and it is work that has to be done locally. Um, you could have hired me to come and tell you what those should be, <laughs> but that's the surest way of not having anything happen. Uh, the way things really happen, the way change happens, is to have it grown from stakeholders, and that's what we're doing. So I have uh, three flip charts to present to you. They are the work of uh, three of different table teams, but I chose them because they represent the tone of the discussion and the direction, in fact, of our entire group of about 40 or 45 people. The, um, the first two are responses to a PowerPoint presentation that I gave called 21st Century Learning. And um, the, the first ones were uh, educational practices. I had shared with them about 40 different issues related to, the, to, to uh, how we deliver education, and then asked the table teams to identify the two most important issues for them in small group discussions. And then we did an overall. So he, these are the most important educational issues 
as determined by that group of 45 people. Six out of eight table teams said that student engagement, maintaining engagement, increasing engagement, getting kids to own their learning and be excited about it is one of our two most important issues. And I did share with them research that from the Gallup poll that shows what that looks like nationally. And um, I can just say that in general across this country, student engagement drops precipitously year by year from a high point in elementary school to a low point right at the end of high school. And so it's a concern nationally, but it's registered here now as a concern uh, locally. The other thing that was identified as very, very important, in, the, in this case, five out of eight table teams um, say that 21st century skills are important. Now, these are soft skills that research has shown are important for success. And success in the 21st century is very different than success in the 20th century um, because the world has changed so much. And now the, the understanding is that the soft skills that have to do with um, how we address problems, how, we, uh, how, how creative are we, how, how, how much of a collaborator are we, are paramount. They're not on the state curriculum and they do need to be taught while doing the state curriculum. So we're not gonna take a break from educational purpose. We will weave these in, uh, as other schools do, as other districts do. We will weave these in and teach these skills while kids are learning the required core curriculum. So uh, to underscore that, a six out of eight uh, are, are, are wanting um, 21st century skills. That's collaboration, communication, creative thinking, and, um, Oh boy. <laughs> um, yeah, there's a fourth one. Sorry, brain pan. It's been a long day. Um, Mr. Locker. Yes. Mr. Locker. I don't know if you're going to get to this later oh, oh. on. So Am I going to remember that, that one? <clears throat> the most important one was student engagement, six out of eight. Yes. So the two tables that did not agree, that, well, maybe not agree, just came up with something else. What were, I'm just curious what. Oh, the, I don't have a record of it, but. I have to tell you, this is a phenomenal plurality. Don't forget, they were given 20 different issues yeah. and asked to only okay. pick two. And for six out of eight to pick. I agree. To pick that is phenomenal. No curiosity kills the cat, so I was just kind of. <laughs> uh, you know, I. Oh. It, it didn't stick in what? You know? This is Bernardo. Yeah, no, no. If you. If I, no, please. But I, just from our group perspective, um, 21st century learning was the one we put at the top. And it's not that we didn't agree with student engagement because that, that is really what a lot of it's all about. But we started with, well, what are the changes we can make that will naturally make them engage? Like, so what are the solutions? What are we gonna implement? Because that's gonna naturally follow. When we start changing how we do things with these kids, they will naturally become more engaged because they're gonna be more invested and more enthusiastic about it. So some of that, I think a lot of it was all very much related, but we might have just thought about it a little bit differently. But your table, like others have done, is you looked at how these 20 issues that I put on the table are interwoven with each other, and which ones might be the ones that you would pick because it would be a strategy to get to others. You're looking, you were looking for bigger accomplishments with your choice of two because I only let you pick two. If I had asked to pick eight, then it would have been easier. Picking two is harder than picking eight. Um, and I'm sorry, I don't recall the others. I, I do have to say that these 20 issues are heartfelt. And as the facilitator, I, well, I actually, I, I really do believe that picking any of them is, is probably a, a good choice. It's the discrimination of which one's most important is what takes it from my general national understanding to the local application bit. And so that's important. And I'm mostly concerned that the, the, the discussions among the tables are, are, are really active and, and that when we get to something like this, to a response like this, it is owned by the participants. And that's what we achieved there. So excellent. That right. was a good thing. The, the second question was, of the 12 facilities issues I posed, which ones were the most important? And here was the scoring on that. This table happened to have had both of them, 
Um, the, the number 22 uh, was safety and security. Again, six out of eight, a phenomenal plurality. And then 21st century schools. Um, so, so this is skills. This has to do with the portable skills that students need. This is how we design our buildings. And so among the things they had cited were making it for student collaboration. Our traditional buildings were not designed for collaboration. Um, common areas, flexible common areas, uh, flexible seating. We, we did a small unit <laughs> on school furniture um, and, and uh, how inflexible and how it's actually punishment for, for sitting on it for, for more than a short period of time. And then uh, they, the last one they cited was facilitation of project-based learning. Again, a very different kind of education. Uh, so I want to underscore phenomenal common responses um, from among those sort of folks. Um, so we did work our way through the day. And as our wrap-up exercise, we looked into school structure. How are we organizing our schools? This is, this is an educational issue. It's a building issue, building by building issue, and a district-wide issue. But this one has phenomenal implications for the master plan. Our architect was with us, and he was eagerly listening to all of this. Um, I had asked them, uh, I guess it was six, four, five, six questions that um, were very deep, open-ended, hard to answer. And I'm just going to highlight what they were. Um, the first one was equity. Is equity important across the district? And what are the areas where we do not have equity across the schools? Um, I think because you have, well, because you have so many elementary schools, uh, this is where the equity question is most evident. With all the kids in the same high school, um, there's equity questions within the building, but not across buildings. So this is a big issue and has phenomenal implications for, um, for, for planning of buildings. Um, the next, I asked them about grade levels and the minimum number of grade levels that should be in a building and a maximum number of grade levels that should be in a building. And the, the, the reason to ask that question, uh, and in fact, the reason to do all of these is to have our participants step out of their day-to-day -day reality, which is often defined by buildings, and have them think deeply about learning and kids and families and teachers and come up with a set of concepts. And we will then present this to the architect to work out what that might mean. So not all of these might finally get to the end, uh, but they represent the best educational thinking we have. And we want our architect to try them out. The old process was to back into this, start with the buildings, figure out how you can tweak and modify them, and to make some adjustments. We're, we're, we're growing a whole, whole concept here. So the reason for the grade level question was to explore the community understanding about transitions for kids and about the effectiveness of multiple grades within a building. So what, what's really interesting about this answer, which was given by eight out of eight table teams, every one of them, was that the minimum number of grades that we should have in any single building is three, and the maximum number is four. Now, if you count on your fingers, the number of grades in your current elementary schools, you get to K, one, two, three, four, five. You get to six real fast. So this is calling into question the current pattern of elementary schools in this district. And as I say, this is an educational concept. Uh, it's a community concept. And we will have to see how well it might fit uh, as, buildings, as building concepts. Um, the um, next question was to look at enrollments and identify advantages and disadvantages of making larger buildings. Um, we know that operationally, larger buildings are more economical to run on a per student basis. And if we could find ways uh, to make the operations more efficient, then you could either 
you know, reduce spending or you can divert the spending to educational purposes rather than operations. So it's simple logic, um, but it opens up lots and lots of issues. So this was an exploration. Uh, from that, we moved on to the question of the Cumberland experience. Now, I put this question on the table because I see this in many communities of this size. And it is the question as to whether we want to create learning experiences for our kids that are consistent across the district. So that a fifth grader, no matter what school they go to, can get the same experience as another fifth grader at another school. And the implication of this may be that we should have all fifth graders in the same school building which is another kind of very different restructuring. And what we got was eight out of eight table teams supported the concept that we should be working hard to create a Cumberland experience. The last two questions related to this were groupings of students with a first, a quick look at the developmental age of kids, uh, table teams looking at how kids, ki kids grow in little spurts or, or pl plateaus in growth spurts, not physically, yes, physically, but certainly emotionally. Um, and so the question was identify that and then identify ideal grade groupings. How do we split these? Because we can't put all kids in one building. Um, and here were the results. Um, Five out of eight table teams said the ninth graders were distinctly different than the 10th, 11th, and 12th graders. And I see this in about half the school districts I work in. A tradition, of course, is to package them with the high school. This is a, another idea. And of course, the transition building may allow that to happen very neatly. Um, the other one was to, uh, there was a uh, pretty strong, but not as strong as the other was, that pre-K should remain a separate entity as opposed to, say, being absorbed in every elementary school or some possible combination like that. Um, and then lastly, I asked them uh, a series of very pointed questions, um, first about pre-K, then about elementary, and then about middle school. And the question on pre-K was that, is it alone or in a school? Four out of eight said alone. Should pre-K be a continuous K through, or should K, can, or should elementary, I'm sorry, should elementary be a continuous, say, K through five, as you have now, or should it be what I call sequential schools, where you do a, um, a K-1-2 followed by a three, four, five. That allows teachers to be highly focused and, the, and, and, and does alter the dynamics of, of the delivery. It also puts a larger cohort of kids of the same age in each school which means that you have improved operational efficiencies because you can balance class size more consistently if you've got more kids of the same grade. So this is a big deal. And we had seven out of eight table teams looking for sequential elementary school. And then lastly, I asked whether we should have one middle school or two middle school, and seven out of eight said one middle school. And I will comment that the reason these are seven out of eight is one of the table teams preferred to have K through eights. In other words, consolidate the middle school concept with the elementary school concept and have nine year long school programs, which is very effective in many communities. Um, and so while they were the outlier, I just wanted to point out that they were an outlier with some very thoughtful ideas. So that's where we are. This was an exciting way to end the day because the dynamics of getting here, the group discussions were really strong and heartfelt. And so for me as the facilitator to observe this kind of engagement, this kind of participation um, makes me feel good. So I'm pleased to be here and share with you. Glad to cover any questions. Excellent presentation. Dr. Locker, anyone else? Anyone from the committee, any questions? Mr. DeMonica. Um, will the report be ready by the 21st for submission to RIDE so that we, um, you know, get on that 
bus, I guess, for $83 million. Um, that's my first question. The second is, is will the architect be able to, if we're talking about combining class grades into one school or two schools, is Toronto Associates going to be able to put a number on that in regards to financing um, for the 21st century model that we're trying to accomplish and the same with ride as well when it comes to this um, money that they want to uh, hopefully get for the schools okay. uh, first question um, I've my, my contract is through uh, Toronto architects I've worked with them on a number of projects and done a number of um, you know ride stage one and stage two etc and um, I will work with them to meet the deadlines for ride <laughs> whatever that means. Um, the, the second is that um, these kind of um, alternatives, um, uh, and it was good that Luis was, was with us today. Um, I don't think that he was necessarily surprised by these possibilities because he's done a lot of schools. Um, the, looking for what this means in terms of buildings uh, really means developing uh, more detailed space needs concepts for the different possibilities. Uh, and, and then looking for the fit between them and the buildings. Um, so to accomplish this, let's say this one as an example, uh, say pre-K, or uh, K to two and three to five. That's the same five year grade levels as you currently have, only it would be taking two of your elementary schools and linking them sequentially, identifying which one would be the, the, the K two and which one would be the three five. That's not, um, that may be a relatively easy kind of a, a, a flip. Uh, the variable is that you'll need more kindergartens in one of them. But we also need, we also know you already need gymnasiums and, and cafeterias in some of them. So there is work to be done uh, regardless of the, what this planning concept is. So um, this mixing and matching and altering, et cetera, um, really does have to be done from the point of view of doing it in the most logical and economical way. Don't be crazy about it, but also meet the goals. And I believe that this will all fit within the timeline that we've got. And, and I'm on board to work with Corrado uh, over the course of this. So I'm not going to walk out and be, and be gone. So. Uh, anyone else? Mr. Dennett. Thank you. Um, when do we talk about enrollment projections? Because it seems like that would play into any plans we make going forward, you know, long term. Uh, it will, uh, and it and it's not my scope. So uh, it's part of the responsibility of under, under the uh, contract. Uh, but the um, enrollment the enrollment projections need to be correlated with these concepts. Yeah. So, for example, if we're going to have an extra, I'm going to pick a crazy number. If we're going to pick, if we're going to have an extra 400 students in elementary school here within 10 years, right? We, we can't use the current numbers. We've got to plan for that number. We we plan for the for the five and 10 year out numbers. So that doesn't need to inform the the visioning session, but it comes after that, and we will it'll be part of Torado's. Uh, there are several streams of analysis that beginning start out separately. Um, this one is focusing on education. The enrollments are uh, usually done by a specialist and are a whole set of analysis. And there's another one, which is facilities conditions. And the Jacobs report a couple of years ago gave you a first understanding of your facilities conditions. Toronto's got to do more detailed work. So you take those three streams, you fold them together, and then you can begin to put together the big picture for, for master planning. Very good. Anyone else? Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Dr. Locker. Next item on the agenda, discussion and or vote to approve 2018-2019 school bus routes. My recommendation is um, a motion to table. I'll make a motion. Mr. Fiorello makes a motion to table the 2018-2019 school bus route, second by Mr. Hess. All in favor? Against? Ayes have it, 7-0. Thank you. 
Next item on the agenda, discussion and a vote to approve the homeschool instruction requests for the 2018-2019 school year. Mr. Mitchell. Uh, Mr. Chairman, as you can imagine, uh, this is the time of year where we get lots of those applications, some uh, new requests, but uh, mostly renewals. So I, I believe there are a total of 57, and I recommend approval. Mr. Mitchell, 57. Is this, is this about the average that we get? Okay. All right. So on the agenda, we're looking for a vote to approve the home school instruction requests around 57. Do I have a motion? Approve, Mr. Chim. Mr. DeMotica makes a motion to approve. Do I have a second? Second by Mr. Denon. All in favor? Against? Ayes have it. 7-0. Thank you. Next item on the agenda, discussion and a vote to rescind teacher dismissal recommendations. Upstairs, we discussed this in executive session. Um, and there was one teacher that was recalled, and Mrs. Fogel thought this wasn't on the agenda, but it is. Uh, all right, so this one was on. So I would make a motion that we rescind the, um, the one teacher, let's call it teacher number one, um, that we discussed upstairs. Mr. DeMonica, thank you for stepping in on this. I appreciate it. So Mr. DeMonica makes a motion for a vote to rescind the teacher dismissal recommendation. Do I have a second? Second by Mr. Fiorello and Mr. Hess. All in favor? Aye. Against? Ayes have it, 7-0. Thank you. Next item on the agenda, discussion in a vote to approve the amended policies. Mr. Fiorello, did you want to tackle this one? I will try. Um, I-13 high school proficiency grading, uh, we are making some changes to that, so I'm going to make a motion to table that uh, until the next meeting. We have a motion to table the I-13. We have a second by, a motion by Mr. Fiorillo, a second by Mr. Denon. All in favor? Against? Ayes have it, 7-0. Next item. I-14, the high school proficiency graduation. Uh, again, this is just about the waiver for the two-year requirement of foreign language. Uh, we expect very few students to be eligible for the waiver. Um, it is clearly laid out within the policy, uh, within the graduation policy. And I would make a motion to approve this. Mr. Farrell is making a motion for the approval of I-14 high school proficiency graduation. Do I have a second? Second. Monica makes a second. All in favor? Against? Ayes have it, 7-0. Thank you. Next item on the agenda, discussion and a vote to approve resolutions. SCR 2018-13 contract extension for HR consultant. Mr. Chair. Mr. DeMonica. This was heard upstairs in fiscal. Um, what, what this uh, resolution does is allows the school committee to purchase an additional um, hours from the uh, Martin Associates, which has been providing, providing human resource um, services uh, for, for the school district until we hire someone. And so um, they need some additional hours, would be 60 additional hours. And it is budgeted in the HR uh, budget. And so this should um, bring almost to an end of what we need for HR services and bring the new person on board. We passed upstairs in a three to zero vote. And I would move passage and it's an ex not to exceed the new amount would be 19,000. Five hundred dollars. We've already uh, approved fifteen thousand dollars previously. Thank you, Monica. Mr. Monica makes a motion for the approval of SCR 2018-13, not to exceed nineteen thousand five hundred dollars, the extension of the HR consultant. Do I have a second? Second by Mr. Denon. All in favor? Aye. Against? Ayes have it. Seven zero. Thank you. Next item on the agenda. Discussion and a vote to approve SCR 2018-14 Communications Services Contract. Mr. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, this was uh, heard upstairs as well. It's a resolution authorizing and empowering the school committee to um, award a contract to Martin Associates providing communication services from July 1st through December 31st, 2018. The original contract that we've had with Martin Associates expired and um, as 
contract continued inadvertently without the school committee's permission. Um, and this would provide uh, services that Martin Associates has been doing um, until that time. We have some items we're working on, such as the um, bond referendum coming up. They give Bob talks and things like that. And um, there's some confusion upstairs of exactly what we're getting um, for this. And Mr. Fiorello made a motion to amend it upstairs um, to be a seventy-five dollar per hour cap, not to exceed one thousand. I'm sorry, nineteen thousand two hundred dollars through December thirty-first. Um, and that amended motion passed upstairs in a uh, three to zero vote. And so I would move passage on this uh, motion. Um, it was approved upstairs in a two to one vote, so we can move this to the full committee. So I'd move passage of uh, this um, agenda item. Mr. DeMonica makes a motion for the approval of the amended, Mr. Adams, correct? It was amended upstairs. So now it's coming to us already amended. We took out the words uh, not to exceed $3,200 per month and it's $75 per hour with a cap of as a minimum. Thank you, Mr. Adams. So I have a motion from Mr. DeMonica. Do I have a second? Second for discussion. Second for discussion by Mrs. Goggin, please. Um, I'm, I'm not. Um, planning on voting for this or approving it. I'm not comfortable with the timeline we've been given. Um, I know we need um, somebody to work on the communication about the bond, but I'm not convinced this is the best vendor to go with either. Um, and for a variety of reasons, historically over the last year and 10 months, um, I'm gonna be voting against it. Okay. Any further discussion? So I have a motion, I have a second. All in favor? Against? So it passes five to two. Oh. Okay, I apologize for it. So let's do a roll. We'll do a roll call. Mr. Demonica, Mrs. Goggin, Mrs. Friedman, Mr. Denon, Mr. Fiorillo, Mr. Hess. The chair votes yes. So the resolution passes four to three. Thank you. Next item on the agenda, discussion in a vote to approve SCR 2018-15 contract for Cumberland High School student yearbooks. Mr. DeMonica. Mr. Chairman, um, previously in the past, the school committee was never involved with the yearbook, who the vendor was. But when problems arise, it always came back to the school committee, why, what happened, you know. And so um, we've asked the superintendent to kind of bring all these contracts that are not in our purview back to us so we know exactly what's going on. So the uh, high school principal in their committee has selected a new vendor to provide the yearbooks for the high school, a company called Coffee Pawn Photography. Um, they're actually going to lower the cost of the uh, yearbook for the students down to $59.66. They are uh, currently being used by uh, Barrington, Rhode Island. And uh, Mr. Uh, Costa is um, confident that this will be a good choice for us. So we would just like to codify the fact that the school committee is now aware of what's happening here. And this is going to the superintendent's office so that we're tracking these now. And so passed upstairs in a three to zero vote, I would move passage that we award to Coffee Pond Photography in yearbooks, even though we don't pay any of it. You know, at least we're aware of what's happening now. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. DeMonica. Mr. DeMonica makes a motion for the passage of SCR 2018-15. Do I have a second? Second for discussion by Mr. Denon. I have a question for Mr. DeMonica. So I know we're not paying anything for this. So do we make any money off the sale of these? I don't know if we're making, at this, at this price, I don't think we're making any money off this. I mean, we do pay stipend for people to get involved but i mean uh, i think this is uh, 
Yeah, I just uh, there's there's no markup that we're aware of. I'm not that Thank I'm you. Aware. Mr. Monica, is there a minimum that the school commits to in the yearbooks? Do you know? I think there was a 288-page yearbook, 100-pound stock. They're doing anywhere from 400 to 499 copies of it. Again, you know, they only got to purchase what they need and then some extras, full color. Um, it's going to be bound. Um, you know, there's custom designs, shipping's included. So there are some, you know, looking here, it's just basically a $500 deposit fee and away we go. So. Excellent. All right, so we have a motion. We have a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Against? Motion passes 7 to 0. Thank you. Next item on the agenda, discussion in a vote to approve resolution SCR 2018-16 amended fiscal year 2019 school budget. Well, Mr. Chairman, um, this was heard, heard upstairs as well. What this is, is we approved the budget for the 18-19 school year of $68,995,714. The town uh, finance director has it as $69,503,910. So what this is, is we are amending our budget to be in line with what the town of Cumberland um, town council the mayor approved for a budget for this year. And so this is just brings that uh, line item indirectly with yours. We voted in the past to make our budgets, you know, line up with what they've uh, given us, you know, authorized for. So this, this is just housekeeping. We passed upstairs in a 3 to 0 vote, and that would make the passage. Thank you. Mr. DeMonica makes a motion for the passage of SCR 2018 16 amended fiscal year 2019 school budget. Do I have a second? Second by Mr. Fiorillo. It's a difficult task, so I'll take a second. All in favor? Aye. Against? The ayes have it, 7-0. Thank you. Next item on the agenda, discussion and a vote to approve SCR 2018-17 fiscal note on Cumberland Teachers Association CTA contract. Chairman, we have reached a uh, tentative agreement um, with the CTA for a three-year contract. They're just working out some some contract language, um, but we've agreed to the fiscal part of it. And so um, this is uh, budgeted this year in the amount of three hundred thirty-two thousand two hundred fifty dollars in twenty nineteen. Um, it is budgeted. We've uh, voted upstairs in a three to zero vote to recommend that the school committee approve this. And this is for 2019 through 2021. And Mr. Mr. DeMonica makes a motion for the passage of SCR 2018-17 fiscal note on the CTA contract that has been budgeted. Do I have a second? Second by Mr. Fiorillo. All in favor? Aye. Against? Ayes have it. 7-0. Excuse me. I'm sorry, Mr. Mitchell. I don't think I have anything, a resolution to sign for this. Am I supposed to? Mr. Prignano, I, I, ass I assumed it was in the resolution book. Um, we'll have to make sure that you uh, that we get one to you, um, uh, Mrs. Gog, and I apologize. Thank you. Next item on the agenda: discussion and a vote to approve resolution SCPR nine two thousand eighteen dash thirty four, additional moving services for summer projects. Mr. Chairman, this was heard upstairs as well on um, what this is. We had a contract with Isaac Movers and Sturridge of Stoughton, Mass. And um, we needed additional moving material and trailers for all the work that happened during the summer. So we are um, amending their contract to add an additional $4,586. So the total amount is not to exceed $71,186. The, it is budgeted in the $5 million health and safety master lease that was approved for work. So um, they've done a good job for the last couple of years. Passed upstairs, 3 0 vote. I move passage. Mr. DeMonica makes a motion for the passage of SCPR 9 2018 34 for the additional moving services from the summer projects. Do I have a second? Second by Mr. Hess. All in favor? Aye. Against? Ayes have it, 7-0. Thank you. 
Next item on the agenda, school committee comments, school liaison reports. Anyone? Mr. Dvodica? Um, Just upstairs, we did discuss tonight briefly, and um, the business manager brought it to our attention about the pool. We're looking at October 1st to start the pool, and you know there was a question whether we wanted to uh, do some of the return work for the HVAC so that chlorine gases, et cetera, and you know, better to move the air in that building um, out. I mean, we've got 60-year-old HVAC system in there. And so um, the are uh, looking for direction from us that if we are going to approve this, that they will go out and get the, the – we already have the bids to bring a resolution to us next school committee meeting to award the work. So we'll do some additional work um, for the ventilation. For the returns only, and then uh, we're getting some bids for the um, shower work and so forth. And that should be applied this year because now we're going to bring the building up to ADA standards in the shower room as well. And uh, I don't believe you can do one without doing the other. So um, just to make a note of it, and they will come back to us um, at the next school committee meeting. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. DeMonica. It is crunch time coming up on taking care of the pool. Um, Mr. Pregnano, how about my question also um, around the pool? Is that is that going to be all, is there a proposal to get that cleaned up and pressure washed? And Might paint it, something, but you can power wash it, clean it up. I think, I think half of it is that the cement when it's cement when it's wet is dark, and slippery. I think we got. A, I slippery think we have too. a lighting issue. I think we need to brighten the lights in there. And I've talked with, um, I've talked with the NE about that. They've done some other lighting jobs for us at schools and stuff like that. You know, LED lighting and that type of stuff to brighten the, the whole pool area up. Kind of similar what we did to the wellness center recently. I think that would. I think that would help a lot, but. All right. Anyone else? Any further comments? School committee comments? No? All right. Hearing none. Thank you, Mr. Pregnano. Thank motion. you, Mr. DeMonica. Mr. Fiorello makes a motion. Oh, hold on, Mr. Fiorello. Are we, do we have executive session, Mr. Mitchell? No, we do not. Okay. Mr. Fiorello makes a motion to adjourn. Do I have a second? Second by Mr. Hess. All in favor? Against? Ayes have it. 7-0. Thank you, everyone. Have a good night.